evening I'm going to be talking about how teenagers tick, but that's kind of a difficult thing to do because we're still figuring it out. And when I shared the title with someone, how teenagers tick, they said, yeah, like a time bomb, which kind of sums it up really. So I thought about being a teenager and just for us to think for a minute, what are some of the challenges that teenagers face in today's culture? Um, challenges that we didn't have to face 10, 20, 30 years ago. Is there anything about being a teenager today that is easier than when you were a teenager? And what are the things that are harder? If I look back on my life, I think I would say, if I could just delete one of my decades, it would be my teenage years. And I really, really would not like to relive that time again, um, back in the, the time when I lived it. And I don't think I would ever want to do it today in, in this current time. So it's a real challenge being a teenager today. And we need to understand everything about them in the, in the context of what they are living in at the moment and the pressures that they face as teenagers because it's a very difficult time. Like in a few years, they're expected to go from being dependent children to being independent adults with you know, a car, a degree, a job, um, relationships, working towards a home. So many things you have to acquire the skills for in just a few years. So there is a lot to be done in that time. And, uh, and while that's happening, while they're trying to acquire all those skills, all kinds of things are happening around them. They are growing and changing in so many ways. And we can see the obvious physical changes as they develop, but the brain is working super hard behind the scenes. And we've only really discovered this recently. The brain is actually rewiring. Now we knew that the brain rewired after toddlerhood about the age of three that the brain then rewires and it cuts off all the things, prunes away all the connections that weren't very useful to make a more efficient brain for learning. So we knew that happened and that's why children who don't learn to speak before they're three find it very difficult to acquire language because the brain says, well, that language part wasn't useful. We'll just delete it because the child hasn't used it very much. Um, but we now know because we can scan brains and we can do all kinds of measurements on them that the, the teenage brain is changing enormously in ways that we didn't realize. The brain is rewiring at this time. And these changes are happening from before or around the age of 11. And the brain takes a long time to do this rewiring. And we're actually still rewiring in our mid 20s for females, most females, and in the late 20s for most males. So those teenage adolescent years, they go on longer than we ever thought they did. So this, this uh, pruning and rewiring is complicated. And if you've ever rewired your house, you will know that there are times when parts of it just don't work at all. You can't get the hot water or the lighting doesn't work or you can't use your cooker for a while. And just like when we're rewiring our house, when our brain is rewiring, there are bits that are disconnected for a time and that can cause some challenges. So this is really all you need to know about the teenage brain. This is it summed up in some kind of um, fun picture that someone drew about how they saw the teenage brain. All of these things going on inside, fitting together, overlapping, um, and all this sort of um, activity going on in all sorts of ways in the average teenage brain. So it's really complicated. Um, the changes in their brains influence everything else that they do, but everything else that is going on around them is influencing their brain, their genetics, their environment, their education, their experiences, their relationships, all of these things are influencing how these connections are made and, um, and formed. The good news is that the teenage brain is at its peak performance for learning and creativity. So amazing things are happening in this brain. We just have to see that they are there and help our teens to, to access the, the creative, the potential, the power of their brain um, in, in the middle of all of this rewiring and something that's a little chaotic. So every teen develops differently and every brain works differently. 
And so there are all sorts of things happening in the brain to, to reorganize, as I mentioned before. The unwanted weaker connections are pruned in order to make the brain more efficient and stronger for the multiple tasks of independent adulthood. And while this is happening, there are some construction sites and probably this is where we bump into teenage behavior and um, probably the most, most challenging things. During teenage years, their amygdala is changing rapidly. And this is the area of the brain most responsible for sensations, emotions and arousal. And also things like your fight or flight mechanism and other important aspects of your survival. And this area can become very sensitive to stimulation in adolescence. They can become arousal seekers. And this can explain why teenagers are more prone to risky, spontaneous behavior. And you just think, how did you do that? How did you just do that and not even think of the consequences? Um, I wish I'd known some of these things when my, my own children were teenagers. And unfortunately, this information wasn't available then. But it will help me to understand teenagers today. And I am now much more compassionate for teenagers. Now I understand what's happening in their brain. So another construction site is the prefrontal cortex, which is undergoing also rapid development. And this is the area of the brain for more intellectual activity, self-awareness, planning, problem solving, decision-making and appropriate social interaction. The problem is that um, this is the area that stops us doing those risky things. But during adolescence, there can be a disconnect between these two sites, which is why they can do things and not think about the consequences in advance and cause some different challenges. So some studies suggest that this area of the brain, the, the prefrontal cortex, does not develop as fast as the amygdala. So the amygdala is getting hyper aroused, hyper seeking sensation and risk. Um, but the bit of the brain that's going to tell them that's a stupid idea isn't developing as fast. So they don't have as much, um, uh, much thinking and, and reflection to decide when things are not really the greatest idea. And this can explain why they behave irrationally at times. So we had um, an experience in our family when our youngest son, Joel, um, decided to climb onto the garage roof one summer and he dragged the picnic table up to the side of the garage, he climbed onto the roof to watch a fire engine putting out a fire in the school behind our house. So he stood up there and he was watching the fire and then it was all over and it was boring. And he, we said, we'll get you a ladder so you can get down. He said, no, 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 I can jump. So there is a garage roof and then there's a very narrow patio and then we have a raised garden. And he said, I can jump from the roof to the grass. I've done it before, which rang alarm bells. And then he said, I've done it with my friends, which rang even more alarm bells. And then he said, I'm just gonna do it now. So he jumped, he jumped over the patio and he did land on the grass. But the difference between the summer, July, when he jumped on that grass and March, when he jumped on it with his friends, was that in March it had rained for six weeks. And in July, it had been sunny for six weeks and the ground was somewhat harder. And he landed and he's like, oh, that wasn't good. And three hours later, we had to take him to A&E to have his entire leg cast in plaster for the entire summer holidays because he was so excited about the risky behavior. Even when we tried to say, that's not such a good idea, he really wanted to do it and he did it and he learned it wasn't a good idea. So how adults can help is when teenagers are engaging in risky behaviors and we can help them. We can be understanding and supportive rather than frustrated and critical. To some point, the way their brain is wired, it's hard for them to, to help what is happening, this desire for risk. We need to give them space to develop in their own God-created way in their life. So they need some freedom to be able to maneuver and make choices on their own. And all sorts of things are affecting um, their relationships and their development. But it's very important that adults can help with the risky behavior because teenagers are really trainee adults and they are learning. And when we're learning, we make mistakes. 
the challenge is, is that teenagers can make rather more drastic mistakes than, than a toddler who's learning. And if they have low self-esteem, if they have a sense of hopelessness, if they're disconnected from their parents, if there is intense peer pressure, if they don't have future goals to, to guide them through the stage, if there are challenges at school or at home, these are some factors that can increase the incidence of risk-taking behavior. Also, extrovert personalities may also be more likely to seek and take risks than introvert personalities. So there's, there's all sorts of changes and, and things that can um, take place. So risky behaviors might include leaving their homework to the last minute, not studying for exams and tests. These are also risky things that can um, have uh, long lasting effects on their life. There's things like self-harm, experimenting with drugs, sex, alcohol, and smoking, and trying dangerous activities and challenges. Um, so I once walked into the kitchen and I found my daughter, my eldest child, um, in the drawer with all the first aid stuff, doing something with her younger brother, who was, they were clearly trying to do something secret and not let me know what happened. So what had happened when I asked and I found out the story, this um, one of my sons had been out with his friends in, in the local town and they found out something really exciting that you could do with aerosol cans and a cigarette lighter. You could kind of throw flames with this sort of combination. And unfortunately, one of the other children threw a flame that uh, basically burnt my son's arm and they were trying not to let me know. So these are some other risky behaviors. They were playing with these things and not thinking of the consequences. So teenagers are likely to take risks. We have to uh, accept that. What we can do as adults is help them to stop and think more carefully through the different consequences of their actions and choices and help them make safety escape plans and be there to catch them when they make mistakes. So your teenager might come to you and say, oh, mama, I want to go to this amazing party. All my mates are going and I really, really want to go. And um, it's easy to say, no, you're not going to that party. There's going to be alcohol there. There's going to be all kinds of wild friends there that I, I don't know. And you're not going to that party. I know what happens at these parties and you are not going. Um, that will usually alienate your teen from you. They will maybe hide their behavior lie, maybe jump out the window and go to the party when you're not looking. So it's best to manage it by saying, that's great, it's great you've been invited to a party. I know how much fun it is as a teenager to get together and, and just have a laugh together. And it's so important you can be with your friends. Being a teenager is an important time to, to socialize. But you know, I have some concerns because there are also risks alongside the pleasure. And we need to think what those are and identify them and think, what are you going to do to manage those risks? What are the risks that you see might be at this party? Because there will be alcohol, there will be this, there will be that. And I need to know that you can manage those risks and then I know you are safe to go. And so you can negotiate with the team what the risks might be, what kind of behavior they can do if they encounter some of these risks and also, you can tell them this, you must always have your phone on and you must always answer me when I call. That's one of the conditions. If you don't do that, then you're grounded because we need to be able to stay in contact with them. So this way you can help them to manage the risky behavior and think it through and have an escape route. So with our children, we had like a code message. If they called us up and said a certain thing, we knew we needed to get wherever they were and get them out of there immediately, whatever time it was. We, we said to our children, this is what we will do. Whenever you feel unsafe, just call us. And if people are around and you can't say exactly what is happening, just say this word and we will know and we will be there. And there will be times when they will take risks and do something um, that isn't very positive and we need to be there to catch them when they make mistakes, to, to love them first, to care for them, to, you know, to help them with their burnt arm or their broken leg. And then later on have a, a more calm 
discussion about risk and how to manage risk when it's not such an emotive situation. It's really important. So another story about our family um, was that Bernie and I were away one weekend um, doing something, doing a marriage retreat, and uh, we left our 16-year-old at home. We thought at 16, he could be trusted to be at home. But then about after sunset, we got a call from him where we were saying, mom, dad, I really want to have some friends over tonight. Is it okay? And we're like, are you sure about this? Do you know what happens when uh, young people realize there are no adults around and you are on your own in a house? Do you understand what can happen? They can all come over more than you imagine. They can overwhelm you. They can cause complete chaos. And he said, oh, no, no, my, my friends aren't like that, mom. They'll, they'll be fine. I know what they're like. They're really good friends. They'll be fine. And I thought, yeah, I know what they're like as well. And I'm not sure that I, I trust them in my house. So I said to Joel, look, here's the deal. If they come, if you really want them to come and they come, we are going to be back home three o'clock Sunday afternoon and the house must look like we left it. That's the condition. Well, we came home to a very exhausted son and the house was pretty much as we left it. There were signs that some things had happened and we didn't ask exactly what happened that night. That was his private area. We were just thankful that he managed to make everything tidy afterwards. And, um, and so we came home to the house. There was nothing smashed or broken or anything terrible. But an interesting thing happened. He went back to school the next day and he never had those friends again. He chose a better set of friends. It was a risky situation to let him stay at home and have his friends around on a Saturday night. And he learned some hard lessons that night that we will probably never know. And that's fine um, because he fulfilled our, our, um, our desire that we should return to an intact home. And he managed to do that. And he realized how much work that can be, I think. So we need to give them some freedom and help them to manage and make some good choices to learn from their mistakes and to be ready to catch them. So we need to understand that some risk taking is essential for learning to occur. You know, you have to try some things before you realize how dangerous they are or what the, what the risks are because However hard we try to explain that to teenagers, until they've had a little taste of it themselves, they probably won't understand. So this is why it's important for us to talk about the risks, to work them through, to work out solutions beforehand. Because when we do that, we help them to join up the risk part of the brain with the more logical, sensible part of the brain and give them some plans, give them some ideas so that when they're in that dangerous, risky or whatever situation, they can go, oh yeah, mom said this and this is what I should do now. So at least I have a plan. So the more we can talk those things through, then the better it will be. And we need to be able to let them go gracefully. Um, holding them too tightly will make things worse. They need this time to increase their independence, but they still need us. It's a bit like a kite, you know, we're like the string holding them, but they need to be able to fly around the sky and do some exploring while we keep them anchored to a loving space. And if things go wrong, we can be warmly accepting, comforting, supportive, and talk later when they're calm. Don't scream at them and don't um, antagonize them because that's very, very difficult. The teenagers need to know that they are loved by their adults around them, their parents, their youth leader. That is so important. It feels so unsafe for them when they feel they are disconnected from us. So the protective factors to help teenagers manage some of the, the challenges that they face, this, um, the risks that are out there, the pressures from their peers, the different opportunities that they have a warm, open, supportive, trusting relationships. The most important thing to build in a relationship with teens is trust, that we trust them and they trust us and they feel safe and they know they can tell us whatever catastrophe has happened. So we actually told our children, you need to know that we love you unconditionally and that 
if something happens to you, um, say you get pregnant or you get someone pregnant or you, you start taking drugs or you have an addiction or you are struggling with something, we want to be the first people to know because we will love you through that. You will need support through that. And we will love you and support you no matter what. So they would know that as they went into their teenage years, that they had this safe foundation, no matter what they had to tell us, they could come and tell us. Now we, we laid that down and I'm not sure they told us everything. And you know what? I'm not sure I want to know everything either, but they had that trusting relationship with us, which helped us to navigate the choppy waters better than if we didn't have that. So we need to educate and empower young people about drugs, alcohol, smoking, other risks, um, so that they understand the truth about them, the reality about addiction, about the effect on their body, so they can learn from reliable sources and have safe and strong values. Maybe even interview people who've made some serious mistakes as teenagers, people who have struggled with an addiction or something, so they can really hear the story of what that was like and the effect it had on that person's life and relationships. We can also role play situations and develop fun and creative ways for them to be a positive role model and influence within a group of teenagers. So they are empowered to be peer influencers. There's a project in Scotland where they train teenagers from 14, 15 to 18. They train them to be part of a group of peers and to influence the group not to overdrink, not to do risky things, not to become aggressive and to choose positive values. So they give these young people things they can say and do that are gentle, that are fun, um, that don't bring them ridicule, but help them to um, take care of the group that they are within and help them to moderate the behavior and keep it safer. We need to be able to know um, the friendship group around teenagers. So um, have their friends phone numbers, or if you're a youth leader, make sure you're in contact as you probably will be with all your young people through WhatsApp or other social media. So that if, uh, if anything happens and one goes missing or you're worried about somebody, you can immediately alert <clears throat> a whole network to the young person who might be lost or might be vulnerable or whatever. Um, and when all their friends are looking out for them and, and contacting them, even if they won't answer our messages, their friends can actually be used to help put pressure on them to, to make contact, to be found, to be safe, to communicate. So one thing we do know about teenagers that we've known for a long time is that they are massively full of hormones. And all of these hormones are running around their bodies, the sex hormones, their stress, cortisol, anxiety and fear can flood their brain. And teens can feel completely overwhelmed by the effect of all these hormones running around in their bodies, making it harder for them to make good choices. It's like a, a whole cocktail of chemicals is racing around their body and they have to navigate that and make good choices in spite of powerful impulses, which is really difficult. But the high levels of stress hormone, if they occur in a teenager, can affect the development of the brain, especially when it's in the rapid development phase of adolescence. So we need to be aware that it's important to help teens manage their stress levels and their anxiety so that it doesn't have an effect on their brain. I was actually talking to someone yesterday whose um, child had become, had been very anxious throughout their life and the anxiety that they had as a teen um, tipped over into in incredibly destructive behavior um, because they didn't know how to manage it. This wasn't a client, so I'm not divulging any information, but just to, um, just to understand how powerfully it can um, change the, the brain and how it develops when there is too much stress and anxiety in the teenage brain when it's developing. It can wire it in ways that are not helpful. So teenagers can be illogical, irrational, inconsistent and unpredictable, and we can help them with their mood swings um, by showing empathy, love, acceptance and understanding. 
So when they lose it, when they get out of control, it doesn't help if we get out of control too, then they feel very unsafe. We need to be a, a calming presence that will help them to calm down too, to love them anyway, to know that when they're slamming the doors and walking out and not speaking, and when they say mean things to us, they will love us really, and they will, they need us to keep loving them through this time and perhaps find some fun and soothing things that you can do together. Just go and have a drive, go and have their favorite um, takeaway, go to a cafe when we're allowed to, um, play a game with them, chill out with them, you know, lie on their bed and have a conversation late at night, whatever it is that just helps them to calm. The more, the more loved they feel by us, the more accepted, the more we meet their relational needs, and the more they have the language to express their feelings in words rather than behavior, those things can help them. Teenagers often sleep deprived and we, we're just finding about this now and you will have probably heard this information, that teenagers release the sleep hormone melatonin about two hours later than children and adults do. So that's why they really don't want to go to bed till after midnight and while they're so sleepy in the morning. It's like they live in a different time zone. I think we should just shift all teenagers to time zones in whatever's the right direction for this so that they wake up in the right place and time. Um, but still their melatonin will kick in at the wrong time no matter what we do. But, so we need to understand that. And actually one of the top schools in the UK has taken this on board and they've shifted all the lesson times for teenagers later in the day to accommodate for the fact that they're, they're barely waking up at nine o'clock in the morning when we're expecting them to do quadratic equations. How parents can help with sleep, um, understand the teenager's sleep pattern, try to encourage, although it's quite hard, to encourage a calm, regular nighttime routine putting away phones and devices. Some families lock them all in a cage overnight while they're charging so that young people can't have them in their room. And that's quite important that they can just wind down and not be alerted to all the messages coming in through the night from their friends and getting distracted. It's important to let them catch up on their sleep at the weekend. So when they want to lie in on a Sunday and they sleep till lunchtime, don't give them a hard time about that. They desperately need that sleep so their brain can um, have the time, the, the space to actually do its rewiring, do its repairing, and it's really good for their health and their mental health. So parents are important to teens and they sometimes treat us, they behave disrespectfully and inconsiderately towards us, but they need their parents as much as when they were a toddler. Um, and they need loving, caring relationships from the adults around them who will understand, support them, show interest in them, people they can trust, people they can talk to, ask big questions to, who will say, like Delmar said, I don't know, let's, let's find out together and help them to, to grow and to learn. We need to love them anyway, always. And I've mentioned this before, but I cannot say this strong enough that Whoever is, has a teen in their life needs to let them know as often as possible that I love you, no matter what you do, what you say, how you look, whether you've got purple hair, whether you get a tattoo, I will always love you. And let them know you will always be there for them, whatever their life choices and mistakes. Because when we do this, we also show them God's incredible love. I have loved you with an everlasting love. And love is interestingly, first of all, patient. And I used to think, because I'm very fond of kindness, that love is kind should be first. But then I realized patience needs to come before kindness. We need to slow ourselves down to take the time to listen to the teen, to understand their needs, to not rush them, but to calmly let them talk to us when they're ready Patience is one of the most important things when we're working with young people and teenagers. To slow ourselves down enough to, to be able to, um, for them to engage with us, for us to think about what they might need and to pay attention to them and not just think, well, I can rush around and do my own thing now because 
my young person can dress themselves and do their own homework and even get themselves a snack if they're hungry. They need time with us. So we must be patient with them, with the kindness. So it's important to stay present and connected with them, not be so distracted by our lives. We must be connected with them pretty much every single day. Um, I was reading some research that if a teen and a parent has a conflict in the day, if they can make up by bedtime, the teen is much happier and healthier than if that lasts through the night and takes several days to repair. So it's really important that we are present and connect with our young people, that they never in doubt that we love them. That is so important. So there are top 10 relational needs, which I talk about often in other seminars, which are 10 different ways to love other people. And particularly teens need all of these different relational needs met. It's so powerful for them because when they are functioning in a, in a world of broken relationships and peer pressure and all the struggles and things that they face, when they, have, they know they are loved in these 10 ways, and there's more than that, but these 10 are a pretty good way, place to start. Um, they can feel much more secure, much more loved. They learn what a healthy relationship looks like. And that is really important because we want to help them choose healthy relationships in the future. If they don't know what a healthy relationship looks like, what love looks like, what love does for another person. It's very hard for them to identify when they fall in love with someone, is this really love? Um, but when they know what love is from the home and their parent and the leader's relationships with them and their needs are met, then they have a much clearer picture in their head of the kind of love they want to be looking for and the kind of love they need to develop the ability to give to somebody else. So we need to be aware of the things that cause painful aloneness in teens and avoid doing those things because they can be so deeply hurtful to them. It can cause them extra anxiety, depression, mental health issues. Um, they don't know who to trust. If they feel this aloneness and this disconnect, it really hurts in their heart. So when in doubt, prioritize your relationship with them and the rest will fall into place more or less when we say, first of all, you need to know I love you. This is a mess, but we can deal with it together. So these are the 10 relational needs on, under the love that every young person um, needs. And uh, they, so it's comfort when they've had a rough day, um, when life is tough, someone to, just put their arms around them, make their favorite drink, give them a hug, spend some time with them, listening to them. That's really helpful. Acceptance, no matter what they look like or what they've done, that we accept them. That doesn't mean we condone what they've done, but we accept them as a person. They need to have our affection. It may change from when they were a toddler or a little child, but they need that pat on the back or some kind words, or we need to discover their love languages. So we can love them in the way that they feel most loved and experience their love. They need our appreciation. They need to know when they've done something right. So when my teenager has done the washing up and I'm putting it away and there's one spoon dirty, I choose not to say anything. I say, thank you so much for doing the washing up. That's such a big help to me. I can wash the spoon when they're not looking and fix that. I want to appreciate the effort that they've made. Because if I pull out that spoon and say, hey, look, you missed this one. You should, you know, you should pay more attention and make sure you wash it properly. The chances are they won't want to help me again. So the more appreciation we give, that's very powerful. Appreciation is far more effective than nagging and criticism. So we need to be able to appreciate what they're doing well, even the smallest amount. There's, um, a guy who works for Care for the Family in the UK called Rob Parsons. And he talks a lot about family. And he talks about going into his teenage son's bedroom one day. And he said it was the kind of room that really needs to have hazard warning sign on the door. Um, and he walked into this room to see his, his son. And he thought, he looked around the room and thought, 
I need to say something positive and really, I don't know where to start. And then he looked up and he looked at the ceiling and he said, hey son, you've got a really tidy ceiling today. And they laughed because they realized that was the only thing the dad could appreciatively say about the state of the son's bedroom. But he was trying, he was trying to show some kind of appreciation. They need attention, they need time with us in the car often or, or playing the game late at night or the one-to-one -one time, just doing what they really enjoy doing most, even if it's not our favorite thing, even if we hate that kind of movie, to go with them when they want to watch that movie and I can just shut my eyes at the bits that bother me. Um, but we need to spend time with them doing what excites them, what, what, what they want to do rather than what we want to do. We need to encourage them particularly towards their, their life goals, not our goals for them, um, but what they want to do, what their purpose and passion is, help them to find the direction they want to go that really inspires them. We need to help them feel safe. And that's why we say we love you no matter what. They need to know that they are precious to us to say, I'm so glad you're my daughter. I'm so glad you're my son. Um, you bring so much to our family in so many different ways. We love you. It's just amazing that God gave you to us. And those words of affirmation are such a blessing and encouragement to them. They speak um, value to them when the whole of society is, is trying to devalue them. And we support them. We help them through their struggles. Can't tell you how many nights we spent making uh, things for the kids' projects for school when it, they, you know, they'd taken a risk, they'd run to the last moment, it needed to be in at nine o'clock in the morning and we're up at midnight creating something unbelievable out of what we have around the house to fulfill their, their homework. But that says support to them. We're willing to stay up all night and fix this with them, help them with it, even when they've had a disaster. We need to be able to apologize to our teens when we mess up or when we cause them pain or hurt. When we apologize to them, they learn about how to apologize they, to us. They learn about forgiveness. When there has been a conflict, it's really important that the adult moves to mend the relationship as quickly as possible because teens and young people do not always know how to do this. And when they can't, they feel really bad inside and it can actually lead to depression and guilt. They just don't know how to mend it because they struggle actually with empathy too while their brain is going through this state. Empathy is very hard for them to, to understand at times. And that's why they sometimes do things to us that, that hurt us because they, they, um, they've lost contact with the empathy for a while. So it's best if the adult moves to mend the relationship and finds a way to sit on the end of their bed at night or as soon as possible go, you know what, I know we had that row, but you need to know, I love you anyway. I will never stop loving you. Um, let's, let's find a way through this together. We need to catch them doing something good as often as possible. Um, even daily if we can, because they, they love it when we just maybe text them, just something simple so we're not like overdoing it because that makes them feel self-conscious. But if we can just spot them doing something right and say, that was really brave when you did that, or I really appreciated what you did there with your little brother, how you helped him with his homework, or I really appreciated that when you borrowed the car, you filled it up again with petrol. Um, also, know what their character strengths or know what character strengths are. You can look these up on a website called Let It Ripple um, and they have um, letitripple.org and it has 24 character strengths and many ways to grow them in our lives. And when you know what they are, you can spot your teenager, your young person showing a character strength and telling them. And that is so powerful to them when we affirm a character strength in their life. It lights them up. Um, and I know as a young person, somebody once affirmed me for my creativity. Actually, I was, I was a child. Uh, but someone said, Karen, that's so creative. And that made me want to be creative. It really inspired me. And that one moment, that one word, really helped to, to shape me as I strived for creativity in my life. 
Um, and things that people said to me as a teenager about you are this, you are that, that message stayed with me. And I wanted to be that kind of person they had seen in me at that moment. It's very important that we educate young people about pornography. This is a really troubling area because um, we don't know the effect of young people being able to access so much online porn at such a young age when their brains are developing. And they tried to do some research on this, but they could not find enough young people who hadn't seen pornography to be a control group, which is a little disturbing. But the reason we need to educate them about pornography is because it is distorting their picture radically about sex. And that is so dangerous. So there was um, a young boy in Scotland, and this is not a, not a nice story, so I'm just giving you a warning if, if that bothers you. Um, but this is that the 14 year old raped his classmate, another girl. And when the teacher said, you know, what on earth did you think? You know, she was screaming, no, no, why did you continue? He said, well, I've seen, I've seen it on the, on the internet and like, they all scream like that. You think, what, what are they watching? What are they watching if that's what they think is normal and they think that rape is normal at 14? And also girls who are watching, they're thinking, if that is what sex is, I don't want to know. I'd, I'd rather choose to be with a girl than to be with a guy if that's what it is. So we need to be aware how, when they access these things, it is changing their mind, it's changing their brain about what is healthy in sexuality and what kind of uh, things are okay. It's setting them up for really unrealistic expectations and dangerous ideas. Fortunately, there are some good resources to help. The Naked Truth Project is one that's in the UK. The SDA have created a new freedom to love.org, um, which is all sorts of training and resources to help people. There's quite a good tech, TED talk called The Great Porn Experiment, which is actually suitable to show young people as well and helps them to understand some of the dangers. And this is a good book written by a Christian young, um, young man um, about his teenage experience. And it's a really helpful book for young people about um, an honest account about God and porn, if you need some resources. So teens don't always talk to us. We wish they would talk more um, sometimes, but sometimes they will just grunt and go monosyllabic. They can, they can talk for hours on the phone to their friends. And then when, when they come and talk to us, it's like, mm, mm, I don't know, mm, like this. And we think, well, where did all those words go? Or have you just used them all up talking to your friends and we've just got the crumbs that are left at the end? So sometimes they will turn away or go silent or show indifference, but it doesn't mean they don't want to talk to you. Sometimes they just don't know what to say or they need to feel safe first. They need to have a warm up with us um, before they can start to open up. They need to spend some time feeling safe and loved and happy with us, playing a game, kicking a football, um, going shopping together, whatever it is that they enjoy, that tends to open their, their mind and their ears to listen to us on, and their, their um, voice to talk to us. It really helps if we've listened to them well when they were younger, because if they know when they're young that they, we will listen to them no matter what, and we will support them through their crises, when they hit the teens, they already have that in mind. They know that we are safe to talk to, that we will listen, and that's an important message. Often we will ask them loads of questions and interrogate them and they find this really confusing and unsafe because they're not sure what the right answers are. They haven't thought everything through. Remember, their brain is rewiring. So sometimes their prefrontal cortex and the, the more thoughtful, intellectual, reflective part of their brain isn't always connected as well as we would like with everything else. And so they can find it quite bewildering when we ask them lots of questions. And again, this is how to warm them up a bit. Don't ask lots of questions, let them talk to you and then um, get them to reflect perhaps on the situation, maybe just simple things like what else could you do next time if that didn't work out or how else can you show your friend that you forgive them or that you want to be friends again? Just simple things, giving them extra ideas for what they could do to solve their own problems and not just solving them for them. 
It's important to watch our face when we're with young people because as adults, we read emotions in people's faces and the rational and thinking part of our brain. So when I look at someone's face and they might look disappointed or a bit sad, I can think, hmm, I wonder what else is happening behind that face. I can be empathic. I can have some other ideas about how to read that face I'm in my thinking brain. But teenagers, we now know, read people's faces in the amygdala of the brain, this risk-taking part, which responds and senses, senses danger and responds to it. And they are hyper alert to threat, disagreement or disapproval. And when they sense there's going to be a threat, that is, we're going to tell them no, we're going to disapprove, we're going to disagree with them, we're going to criticize them, then they, if they read that in our face, they will get a fight or flight response, which is, this is why they will either get aggressive and cross and angry with us, um, maybe throw something if things are really bad, or they will run out and slam the door. And that's the flight, I'm out of this conversation. And we need to be really aware how, how our face looks to young people. So when we, when we have a smiling open face, and they don't perceive that we're a threat to them and they are much more likely to, to stay with us and to talk things through. But if they sense a threat in our face, this is why they will respond in this way because they can't analyze faces the same way that we do as adults. We need to listen well to teenagers, listen for their unspoken needs and emotions, ask how we can help and actually respond to the feelings fueling the words. Listen to this, this is a bit tricky, but often we will react to the tone of voice and the words that they say. And what we should do is just let that go and think what are the feelings fueling this and respond to them um, calmly and understandingly and, and caringly, compassionately. And so that can be really challenging because they can say angry, hurtful words in a, in a critical way. And we can get, we can get, um, riled as well. We can feel angry and want to react the same way, but we need to just listen to the feelings underneath and say, Phew, it sounds like you've had a really tough day. How can I help you? What can we do about this now? Um, can, I, can I get you a drink? Let's just sit down and just think about this rather than just, you shouldn't say things like that. That's completely stupid. You know, you've got to go to school tomorrow. So don't talk about leaving school. You've got to get your studies. So you just, instead of saying that, it sounds like you had such a tough day and that softer tone, listening to the feelings underneath the words can help them to calm down instead. We need to make sure that we don't shame teens. So we need to have a difficult conversation with our teen, listen to them first, don't rush them, show that we're truly listening, sum up what they say and make sure that we're not doing it in front of their siblings or their friends or anyone else where they might feel shamed because that is incredibly painful for teenagers to feel that they are shamed. Underneath the argument or the anger or the frustration, teens are really asking us, do you love me? Do you care about me? Can you understand what I'm going through right now? Can you empathize with me? Are you willing and able to help me when I'm struggling? Will you Give me a hand here when I have no idea what to do with my homework. Will you always be there for me? Can I depend on you? When we live and interact with teenagers in a way so they always know we care, that we try to understand their feelings and listen to them, that we show that we're willing to help them and that we're dependable and will always be there for them, it often lowers the, the tone of the argument because when they feel those questions are answered in their heart, then they are more at peace with us. And, uh, and often underneath an argument, it's not about what they're arguing about. They're trying to find out the answers to these questions. So if we can live those answers daily, that will really help. So we need to choose a good time to speak if we need to talk together, stay calm and speak quietly. When you're talking to your, your teenager or young person in a, in a stress time, because that will reduce the release of cortisol in their brain. When we stay calm and speak quietly, it helps them to calm too. Let them know that we love them, be appreciative, and turn your complaint into a polite request. In this situation, when this happens, I feel this. 
And it would really help me if you would do this and then I can help you by doing this. What ideas do you have? So you might say, when you don't come home at the time we agreed, I feel, I feel anxious and, and frightened and I'm, I get more and more worried about you. And it would really help me if you would give me a call on the phone or you know, come home and we say, because when I feel calmer and I know that I can trust you, then I can help you by doing whatever it is and then invite their ideas too. So respect is listening to their ideas, their opinions, and you can invite teens to help you make good rules for their safety and well-being. When our children were teenagers, we said, okay, what kind of rules should we have in this house to, for us all, what, now you're teenagers, what are the best rules we could have? And they came up with the rules and they came up with the possible consequences. And actually when they broke a rule and we said, so, you know, what, what punishment or consequences do you think um, you should have for this? And they said, well, we think you should ground us for like two weeks. We would say, well, that's a bit rough. Why don't we just do it for a week? And then we would lessen whatever consequence they had said. And that way we could show them grace. So they need to have boundaries because boundaries help them to feel safe. They need to know when there's a time that they should be coming home. There's places that they we'd rather they didn't go. We don't want them to go until they're ready and we know they're safe. And we need to enforce these warmly and make it easy for them to stay inside those boundaries. And any rules and boundaries should be made for the benefit of the teen and the teen should see that and not for the parent's convenience. We need to be have a warm relationship when we want to set down a rule or a boundary and help them understand the importance of complying with the rules because it's good for their safety, their well-being, their future hopes. And we need to avoid harsh punishment because it can lead to greater conflict, it can lead to huge resentment and cause even worse problems. Um, and it's best not to take away personal property that's precious to them, like phones and tablets. Um, the research is showing that's not a good plan. You need to find another way to enforce the boundary. And the message behind it all is, I love you too much to let you do that. What we want to do is to build resilience in them by loving them, affirming them, identifying their positive character strengths, encouraging them, helping them persist with difficult things, helping them to find solutions to their own problems and support them so that when there is a challenge, when they do hit the rock, they will bounce back from those challenges with help and love. And we help to give them a robust um, resilience and help to support positive mental health. And of course, we need to pray for them daily because if there's one thing that's hard in this world right now, it's always been tough being a teenager. It's even tougher in the 21st century. And it's even tougher in 2020 when they are disconnected, when they're dealing with all these other anxieties. There's so much they're dealing with. So here are some resources. If you have conflict with teens, you can go to the Scottish Conflict Resolution website. I used to volunteer and work with this organization. I've trained with them and done training for them. And their website is packed with really useful um, uh, resources to help with teen conflict. There are little quizzes for teens to do to find out their conflict style. There's lots of blogs, information, and lots and lots of free training, which is currently online. Um, if, they if you have troubling behaviors in a teen, you can go to handsonscotland.co.uk. I also wrote for this website and they have some really good tips there to help you with all kinds of behaviors that might trouble you in a teen, what to do, and also ideas of how to help them flourish. I really enjoy Dan Siegel. He has a two hour YouTube um, video called The Power and Purpose of the Teenage Brain. And that is really well worth watching. He knows more about the teenage brain probably than anyone in the whole world. And he has written a book to help teens understand what's happening in their brain. And you can watch this two hour long YouTube video with a teen and you can both learn together and laugh as well because he's also very funny. Well, how do teens tick? That's only just scratching the surface and research is going to show us more and more about how teens tick as time goes on. But what I do know is that the same things that have always been needed for teenagers 
is our love, our forgiveness, our acceptance, and our support. Those, all those relational gifts that help them to stay strong, to experience our love and to experience God's love through us through this difficult time. Thank you.